Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Blueprint Podcast. Again, I am your host, John Hubbard, and we have with us again our authors of 11 Strategies of a World-Class Cybersecurity Operations Center, Kat Nerler, Ingrid Parker, and Carson Zimmerman. Uh, welcome back to you all. So we are going to get into a topic today that I think is going to be a very, very interesting one because there's a lot of kind of high-level information out there, but I I'm sure listeners are going to be interested in hearing some of your low-level practical advice on this, and that is cyber threat intelligence, right? This chapter is called Illuminate Adversaries with CTI, and I always love talking about CTI myself because I am not a CTI expert. I'm a SOC person. You know, I know there's a, that's a whole different level of expertise and a, and a different thing that uh, people turn into entire careers, and that is not what I've done. Hang out with those people, but that's about it, and always pick up some awesome stuff when I talk to people who know CTI. And also, um, a lot of people are confused at just what it is, what it looks like, and what are they aiming for. So i um, really excited to get into some of those kind of factors when it comes to CTI. So to, uh, to kick off the episode here, one of the first things I want to ask is, uh, what is CTI and why is it something that's important for us all to have? Yeah, I'll start there, John. Um, great to be here again. Uh, cyber threat intelligence, we gave a very a lofty um, definition of it in the book. It's pretty long, actually. And it was the, the combination of smashing together several different sources for that definition. But in a nutshell, it's really any kind of information that can help you make decisions, right? So just boiling it down to, is it technology information? Is it adversary information? Uh, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, you know, it's anything you can use that will help you either find more adversaries in your environment or alert you that this could happen to you. And so that's the easiest way to de um, to define and talk about CTI. Who is making the decisions and what kind of decisions would they be making if you have good CTI? OK, that's that's a really, really excellent question. So if you're an incident responder, you're going to want real tactical, uh, what do I actually do with the information I have kind of information. So uh, that's going to be a different kind of intelligence than, say, informing your CEO or your business lead or someone who's not technical to say, yeah, uh, you know, these um, these criminals are actually accessing our, you know, our pay information. So those are different kinds of levels of CTI. And that's that's the whole thing about CTI and why it's so confusing, because there's different levels. There's uh, if you go to your uh, DOD and intelligence community kind of stuff, you have tactical, you have strategic and you have operational kinds of intelligence, and they're all used to do different kinds of things. So maybe we should start there where um, in terms of strategic uh, intelligence, how would you describe what that is? So strategic is really um, taking that long view. It's often something that you think about from more of a, a government or a nation state perspective. And it's really understanding the overall intent and capabilities um, and how that can impact you from a risk perspective. And so thinking about, um, you know, again, coming mostly from a, a government perspective, you know, how does the actions of another country fit into what you're trying to do, whether that's with negotiations, whether that's financially, whether that's, you know, unfortunately with wars or other types of things, you know, we are now seeing that, um, you know, cyber is part of actions that are happening around the globe as countries are engaging with each other. It can also be strategic within companies though. You know, you can see, um, Maybe there's an adversary that has an intent to disrupt a market or wants to get into understanding your um, your knowledge around a negotiation when you're trying to do an acquisition. All of those types of things, really understanding that high level, what are they trying to do? Why are they trying to do it? Is going to set you up to think about them from a long-term risk perspective. Makes John, sense. I'll, I'll offer, um, since we want to try and be concrete um, in this chapter, I'll offer a couple examples to go along with what Ingrid was talking about. Um, you know, we recognize that uh, there there are typically, particularly in very large nations, multiple different adversaries that we associate and attribute to a specific nation. And I'm not going to mention names in today's podcast, simply to say that there are multiple adversaries um, that are associated with nation state in interest for a given country. And understanding just like what Ingrid was talking about is the motivations for each of those actors 
is particularly important when we're thinking, uh, we're actually in an incident response and we're seeing a given adversary, which we have not yet attributed, perform certain actions on objectives or take actions that indicate the motivation of where they want to get in the enterprise. And that helps us then make those associations, which we'll probably talk about today as well. Um, and then kind of know what, well, what do, you know, what do we need to do next? Perfect. So we got this high level kind of strategic intelligence that's going to be probably for decision makers and budgetary purposes and stuff, just kind of saying like, who's out there? What do they want? Uh, what's the next level down on the like pyramid of, of detail when it comes to threat intelligence? So operational would be the next level down, and that is looking at um, some of the, the capabilities of your adversaries. So what kinds of tools do they use? Maybe not the exact uh, way they've used a tool or TTPs, as we call them, tactics, techniques, and um, procedures. That's going to be more in your tactical. As, as operational and tactical tend to kind of overlap a lot. Um, I don't think there's any one clear way to look at it, but operational, I look at that middle tier of what are the, you know, the more general things they use. Do they use networks? Do they, um, do they come at you through a user? Do they, you know, focus on one kind of um, activity? And then just to go into the tactical too, uh, the tactical is going to be more about what exactly are they doing? Uh, what does it look like? How does it manifest itself in your environment? Um, what are they interested in? Um, it's the very tactical um, items. So what would be like an example of a concrete piece of like something you would call tactical intelligence versus maybe something that would be at the, the operational level? I'll, I'll give a couple examples here and then I can't wait to see Ingrid whether they uh, affirm or refute my, my assertions. Um, when we talk about CTI, the big elephant in the room is, is people think about long list of indicators. And we'll talk about long list as indicators here. But I think in this conversation, we're, we're also thinking about all kinds of other stuff like, you know, what hours out of the day against UTC does a given adversary typically work? Do they, are they known to do false flag operations? Um, are they motivated um, for primarily financial reasons um, versus um, are they, you know, interested in something like espionage or disruption or things like that? Um, one of the other things I'll offer is, is I've already introduced bias into our conversation because I started talking about nation states. And one of the things to think about when talking about CTI is we must not just be thinking about nation state associated actors, though they get a lot of fanfare. We should also think about um, CTI in the context of binning um, actors that look um, more like zombies than dragons, meaning, um, you know, large, you know, highly numerous, unattributed, um, you know, actors, again, financially motivated might be a very good example where there's thousands and tens of thousands of them. And trying to attribute any one of those may not be worth our time, but as a class and a group, we can think about what they're up to and make generalizations in the context of both detection and response. Perfect. And building on that idea of it's not just nation state, you know, and trying to get more specific, think about something like ransomware. So a tactical would be, hey, they, you know, installed Qbot or some particular piece of malware was their initial, you know, way that they were doing access, you know, through through emails or something else, and you know what's happening. At the more operational level, you're really thinking about what is that chain of events? What is likely to happen next? What do you know is in their toolbox? How do they go together? So what can you anticipate and expect that you're going to see from either a particular adversary or a class of adversaries? And then at the more um, strategic level, that's where you're thinking about what are their objectives? What are they trying to do? Are they, is this a group that is known to um, just do ransomware? Or are they a group who also steals your data and tries to do a secondary of stealing your data as well as doing ransomware? And so you can, they absolutely build on each other and understanding all three different levels allows you to decide what actions you're gonna take um, based on that info that you've got. So if, if we need all three levels, um, is it, is there an approach that the average team should take? Are they starting at the tactical level, collecting things until they start to see the bigger picture? Or is it their you know, CISO talking to another CISO and one being like, hey, did you hear about Group X? And they're like, oh, no, I didn't. And then it kind of filters down in the other direction, a little bit of both. How do we get all those levels? I think I'll start there. So how to get started is almost a, a way to look at yeah. this, right? So start with your own incident data. So uh, you know, what have the adversaries or what have the incidents look like 
that are in your environment, you know, and if you can trend it over time, even better. So are they super, were they hard to find? Were they very sophisticated or do they just seem pretty straightforward and easy to deal with more, more of a malware kind of thing? Um, was there ransomware involved? So starting with your own data is probably the best way to start looking at CTI because the best CTI kind of looks like what you already have, but maybe then you augment it with other sources of information. I'm going to double down on what Catherine said. I, I had no surprise. One of the ways I think about how can the SOC distinguish itself among any other member of the IT and cybersecurity apparatus in an enterprise? And that is becoming uh, eloquent and conversant in this CTI that is relevant to its own enterprise and indeed starting with CTI sourced from its own incident data. This is how other people can look to the SOC as authoritative. Yeah, I like that. Um, is there uh, like a particular, let's see, how can I phrase this? Where, uh, besides your own incident data, really, like where else should we be looking, right? Because yes, of course, we want to be collecting our own, but like, is there, it's going to take a while to build it that way, right? And and people don't want to say like, all right, well, I'll wait a year, then maybe I'll have intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> what, are the, what are the secondary sources that people should try to go to if they want to jumpstart a CTI capability? I'll, I'll start. People usually think about news reporting and CTI feeds, which we all have feelings about. I would actually bias first to other socks. Friends of the whoever your socks friends are, usually in within a industry vertical or geography or both. Um, some of the highest fidelity tippers I've seen come from partners who the SOC has personal relationships um, with. And there are a bajillion other benefits from fostering those relationships as well. But at a high level, I would bias there first. Any idea how to make those connections if you don't have those kind of already established because either you're a small company or you just don't happen to know anyone? Is there a, a SOC speed dating circuit you can go on or <laughs> something where you can, uh, some place that people congregate where you might be able to make those connections? You know, you can, uh, um, this may be controversial, but if uh, there are businesses who compete with each other, but don't compete with each other when it comes to security. Mm. So there are major players in, in competing, you know, if because they're in the same uh, field or the same, they sell the same kinds of products. Um, but what you can do is almost cold call them, you know, from one sock to another. I've done that. I've done some cold calls because you, you, you get some um, creds just for showing up when you're in a SOC. So uh, yeah, I would start with that calling, calling other security op operation centers. Yeah, I'll um, offer one. Um, uh, ISACs in the United States, ISACs, um, and both in the United States and other countries, um, the national cert or regional cert um, germane to whatever country you're in. One of their major jobs, those ISACs and those certs, C-E-R-T by the way, is to foster those communities. Yep, and first.org is one of the oldest ones out there. In fact, might be the oldest one out there for socks all over the world. Um, CTI is, it, when it comes to incidents, uh, the incident response teams work very heavily with CTI a lot of times, so. Um. And I would say even beyond that, although um, we probably will hit on and caution against things like um, just in ingesting you know, all the IOCs you can find or anything else, or just using a vendor product that isn't tailored to you. The fact is your vendors probably have CTI teams, you know, for many, many of your major applications, they're going to put information out that is going to be relevant to the technologies that you're using. Or if you have an MSSP or some sort of organization, they are probably putting some information out, um, you know, and then certainly looking towards the the big vendors like Microsoft and others that you're going to have in your environment, like they're keeping an eye on this. They have huge teams. That's what they do. And so looking to those vendors that are relevant to your organization and seeing what they're putting out um, can be really valuable as well. 
So you're saying if I go to my vendor and I just download a list of everything they know, <laughs> I'm pretty much good to go then and we can just close up which the is why I start, Which is why I started with the, but we were cautioned against the <laughs> downloading a list of all the IOCs. Yeah, yeah. So that, that brings me to my next question, right? Is, is we've kind of said what, what CTI is, but can we explicitly say what CTI is not or what is not CTI rather? Yeah, we'll also get into some of the criteria that helps you judge whether CTI is good CTI or not, and back to the vendor point. Um, but yeah, certainly IP addresses, um, just, you know, domain addresses, all that list of stuff uh, that I think we have in the book um, is not CTI by itself, uh, because those are just lists of things. You haven't done any uh, connection with other information. The key to CTI is information that helps you make decisions. An IP address by itself doesn't help you make a decision about, well, what do I do with that? You know, because we know IP addresses are used all the time. And we all know that blocking an IP address is really not going to help you. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I, I can personally vouch for that the, the bane of my existence for quite a while was like the threat intel alert that says someone went to a bad IP. And then, OK, now what? Right. Um, yep. let, let's continue to pull that thread. Right. Let's say you do download the list, which is not necessarily a bad thing to do. It's just maybe not CTI, as we're calling it. Uh, if you have a sock that has a full, you know, beautiful, ideal collection of CTI versus a sock that just has a list, uh, what is a analyst doing in the sock that has the CTI versus not? Like, what's the, how's the workflow look different? Well, I'm glad you're asking that. <laughs> I would bring you to one of our um, prouder things in here, figure 14 in the book. Um, it talks about three different kinds of data coming together. So what makes CTI valuable in information is when you're able to bring that together with your own technical environment, as well as the relevancy to your missions and, and businesses. So taking information that CTI, information about your adversary and knowing what they're going to go after. So if you, you're concerned about intellectual property, um, that's something you're going to look at differently than if you're interested in someone taking out your network, right? So those are different kinds of um, attacks, adversaries, all of the different kinds of threats. Um, and then you look at your technical environment. So does your adversary care about Microsoft Azure or AWS, or do they care more about looking for legacy environments of which you have a lot of legacy types of things, your old school, you know, um, Microsoft systems or whatever, uh, desktops. So, you know, it's combining the three kinds of informations together to be able to put together that picture to make it useful to you. And that's also how you're going to judge whether the CTI you're getting is helpful or not helpful to you. I'm going to, I'm going to provide a, a concrete example of what Catherine just talked about. Um, let's say you're in retail. The CTI that is of most interest to you is going to be the CTI that pertains to, you know, the attack tiles, that have to deal with quite frankly operating retail and one of those pieces obviously is going to be malware that runs on point of sale systems that does stuff like um, retrieve credit card and other um you know transactional data like that and that really narrows the kind of cti feeds that you're going to ingest and really narrows how you're going to apply them to your own telemetry um and that's that's pretty succinct and that i think is those are the kinds of situations you know, you want to look for. If you've got as a SOC, if you have, you know, attributed previous incidents to an adversary that is known to do, um, you know, just, you know, do uh, destructive uh, type malware, you know, the kind of malware that will just brick your systems, you know, guess what? Um, that's going to really narrow what kind of CTI you want to ingest and then fuse moving forward. Gotcha. So if you wanted to go shop for CTI that's going to have all this information and it's going to be relevant and all of that, um, what are the kind of questions that you're maybe asking a vendor that you're considering purchasing threat intelligence from or things like that to uh, assess, right, whether they're going to be the, the best possible match for your company, your industry? Yeah, we've got a, a set of characteristics in the book. Um, the four B ones being, you know, is it actionable? So is there something that you can actually do with this given uh, the scope and scale of your SOC and the data that you collect? Um, 
sometimes you might get really interesting CTI, but if you don't have that particular log, or maybe you're not, you don't have a malware analyst who's, you know, on your staff all the time. So you can't act on some of the things that are there. You need to think about that. Um, timely. So thinking about when do they um, provide that update and that information, how fast does it come out? Um, and how fast and how would you go about ingesting it? You know, is it something where it comes out a week later and then you have to manually type it in? That's just not going to be relevant versus having an API being able to pull it in um, and have it fit within your your system. Yeah. Um, relevancy and accuracy are two others that we also uh, look at in that space. Oh, yeah, oh, the relevancy, oh. I think what you want to ask the vendors is how many different customers are they collecting information from that are in your mm -hmm. industry, right? So if they don't know anything about manufacturing and that's your business, then that may not be the CTI for you. Um, it's probably okay CTI. It just might be, you know, if you only have so much money, you want to, you know, focus on those that really hit your industry. Yeah. There's John, also would... a lot of repackaging that happens. Yeah. So you do want to think about, you know, where they're getting their information from, because if they're looking at an open source feed and then taking that and just giving it to you, that's different than they're looking at an open source feed and they're adding their own context on top of it and then providing you enriched data that you're getting. So really understanding what the sources are is going to help you understand whether maybe you could just go get that same information yourself or whether they're adding that value that really can make a difference. John, I would I would um, generalize your question, not just to the commercial situation, but any situation where the SOC is in, is considering a given CTI feed, they might be open source and it might be for another SOC, be it a national SOC and ISAC or what have you. Um, you know, I fondly remember I'm I'm uh, being facetious here. I fondly remember situations where these coordinating SOCs would aggregate um, TI from others and redistribute it. And by the time you got it, it was old and so watered down that it basically said something to the equivalent of something bad happened on the internet last month. And it's like, thank you for telling me something bad happened on the internet last month. So just like Ingrid and Catherine are saying, we've got to really focus, you know, is it got, what's the provenance and pedigree of that? Is it somebody just repeating something else? Somebody has said, how much overlap is there? That's actually one good thing to measure, especially if you're in the front end of that is how much is this overlap with stuff I've already got? Is there an easy way to do that? Um, depends on the systems that you're running. Um, I am, I am, a, I am writing a an outer, or excuse me, an anti join in my mind right now um, that would do exactly that. If you get that TI in the the same place you've got your other TI, you know, look at the percentages of overlap and look at that contextual data that either brings. You might actually down select to a feed that has smaller coverage if the contextual information is much stronger or more accurate. And I will say there is a lot of overlap with uh, open source feeds. That is a really popular thing that um, threat vendors will pull in is open source feeds. So if you're just getting a lot of data, that's not necessarily good. You know, you want good data, not a lot of data. Um, but those open source feeds, I would go back to looking at those. They're freely available on the internet. Um, I think we talk a little bit about them in our book, um, but looking at those and doing a, a dip or a comparison with what the vendors are offering you. Yeah, that's on page 162. There's a whole yeah. list of them. We don't in endorse any specific feed. Rather, we take the perspective of offering a whole bunch to get started. Exactly. Perfect. When you're, um, when you're ingesting this data, and, and we'll get to platforms in just a second here, but I wanted to ask this question first. Let's say you have you know, three or four different threat feeds uh, of varying sizes, varying sources and things like that. Um, as a team looking at those four feeds, how are you comparing them against each other? And how are you making the call of which ones are good enough and which ones you might want to get rid of? Like what kind of metrics or really anything might you use to say, uh, w you know, judge one from the other? I guess what I would f start with in something like that is pulling in a, several feeds at once into your, if you have a correlation engine or if you're writing scripts to be able to look at your data, I'd pull it in with the existing incident data and your technical environment data to kind of take a look at it and see what's coming up. Um, and, and I'd run some correlation ideas. So yeah, there, there's no doubt about that. I would offer one thought. A lot of people will approach CTI and new and they'll start doing IOC matching, straight IOC matching. And 
that can be very exciting. And then you get past the, okay, I've got 100,000 hits yesterday mm-hmm. on this uh, TI feed. Now what? And, um, and, and all the way to, you know, going back to our, our point about the best CTI is C- often is CTI that you have produced yourself. Even in the case of, it, of an incident where we've got some low fies, like some IP addresses that we've known to see associate with an actor C2. And we always, in both these situations, we have to be careful not to just automatically go high severity alerting with just the IOC matching. Um, some of the best use cases in CTI um, is where we're doing, we're fusing IOCs in the context of other, other signals that together make it much more confident. And I like to, when we think about CTI, there's the IOCs, but you actually want to understand, you know, those TTPs, the tactics, techniques, and procedures. You want to think about that potentially in, as related to the attack framework. You want to think about that from a coverage and collection possibility. You want to think that from a detector possibility. So it's moving from something where you can just take those atomic indicators and put it in your system to something where you can look at it and say, okay, can I use this to maybe customize what I'm looking for in my environment or to help me inform that I need to be getting data, different data because the adversary works in this way or to create a new detector that is going to be looking for X, Y, Z that we weren't looking for before relevant to your industry. So it's really not just can you automatically put something into your system, which can be valuable, but then you run into the false positive, false negative challenge. It's can you then use that to do more tailored things for the collection and detection that you're doing within your SOC? Okay, so we're getting all this data that we're downloading from different feeds and different vendors and collecting from our own incident uh, response capabilities, and, and we need to put it somewhere, right? And we need to make sense of it. Uh, threat intelligence platforms are going to be the answer for that, obviously. But um, could you speak a little bit about uh, what we're looking for specifically in terms of features, in terms of choosing a threat intelligence platform? Uh, how do those kind of make sense of all this data? I can I can start. Um, I think. When I think about threat intelligence platforms, along with any other merit major area of the SOC, I want to think about really what our aspirations are and how sophisticated are the SOC's use cases. Let me give a couple uh, concrete examples. Um, there are a very large number of SOCs out there where their aspirations really center around ingesting intel others have created maybe doing a little bit of light ioc work itself and fusing that data into the information that they're collecting in those situations um using the capabilities that are native to their log management or sim or big data solutions may be sufficient um you know organizing IOCs as an ordinary table or set of tables um, in a big data solution and then running an inner join on them on every 24 hours might be okay. They that might yield some some threat hunt um, or you know some fusion with some other telemetry that by itself is just great. And in that situation, there's not a, a strong rationale to go and spend a bunch of money or time integrating a peer play tip. Um, there are other socks, you'll generally know who you are, um, where there are multiple people on a regular basis, perhaps every day, who are looking at information of a bespoke nature, usually derived from the socks own TTPs, sources and methods, etc., where they need to put that in a place where they communicate around those bespoke findings. Um, and it will feel they'll feel that way when they move from a line of thinking that's focused around incidents to a line of focus around adversaries and campaigns. And you'll know who you are when you start thinking that way. And it is that point in time where I most strongly advise a platform that is meant specifically for managing threat intel. 
because it comes to a conversation, not just about importing and fusing IOC lists, but talking about threat intel routinely. And that's where I think the, it's the strongest situation for having a tip. And that tip, it might be built into your SIM, might be built into your case management system. You might have a pure, pure play product to integrate with those others. So in your experience, does that conversation kind of emerge as a SOC becomes more mature or maybe the other way around, a more mature SOC has those conversations? Uh, is there some kind of, of correlation of the development of CTI there that it, it naturally ends in, okay, now we know who these groups are and, oh, it's them again, and, oh, here's everything we know about them, and an ability to look that kind of thing up? Yeah, and, and, and where that may start is, oh, this seems familiar. I think I've seen this before and having that persistence of memory. And in particular, one of the areas the socks may be challenged is when you've got person A and person B and they've seen the same thing at separate times, but they don't know it. And it's really cool seeing some uh, case management and SOAR platforms actually help us do that by helping us recognize, oh, I've seen a given entity in this incident, it's flagged that as seen in another incident before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the things I think is a, a core piece of, of having a threat intelligence platform is like, if you see the same thing twice, that's the tool that should be able to point it out, if nothing else, right? Uh, some some ability to say that's that's the, the item we've, we've run into before, uh, and, and make those automatic kind of correlations and pass that stuff out. Uh, the, the other thing I was kind of wondering about this in, and I get this question all the time as well. Um, this might be one of those like throw a grenade and stand back questions. Should we uh, expire indicators out of our threat intelligence platform? Oh, I want to do this as just a straight yes, no from each of us. So I say yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Wow. Right. Not a grenade. Amazing. When not, do we do there's, it? There's no question. There's no yeah, question, question, right? Their IP addresses that or or domain names that last only seconds for crying out loud no mm -hmm. question yeah now, that being said we have had like some detectors that have been sitting around for three years and have never fired and then that ends up becoming the thing that is the only thing that let you know something happened so you need to think about the um the kind of but it hadn't made noise for three years Mm -hmm. And so you need to think about how much noise it's making, how much processing it's taking up, you know, what the fidelity is of what's going to come out of it if it does go off, whether you have other coverage in that area, you know, so kind of moving away from the IOCs, but thinking about detectors as a whole, if you have um, an area where you have a lot of great detectors, you know, maybe you don't need to have IOCs in there because you've got a lot of other ways to look for something. If you have something, you know, where you just cannot pick some, you know, a particular adversary's actions up unless you've got the IOCs, you're probably going to want to leave them in there longer. So I think even for IOCs or something else, it's not an easy like, oh, you rotate off after 18 months or three minutes or whatever it is. You have to think about it from your whole collection strategy and your whole alerting strategy and figure out where it fits. Yeah. So where a platform is useful is, you know, along with the campaign idea, if you find that your organization is trying to figure out patterns and trending over time, and your traditional incident response data is not giving you that information, that's when you start looking at maybe we need this more sophisticated way of analyzing. Because really a tip is all about that, is where what else can I analyze? How can I bring in more data sources, different data sources, and compare them with um, our data that we already have? So that's what a tip buys you. It's, it's more sophisticated analysis that you can do. The other point I wanted to make is uh, there's a lot of security operations centers out there who pull in CTI and then don't use it. So <laughs> I, I, let's, yeah. let's let's talk about I want to talk about that. OK, um, that's one of the elephants in the room. One of the things I've seen many socks do is to stay in the newsletter business. They'll have one person and all that person does is read the news, summarize it and redistribute it. And that's all the sock sends out to its constituents every day. And it's sort of like, ah, oh, where is the relevancy? Right. Why do I care about this? Ooh, it sounds sexy. So what? Yeah. Um, so when you're figuring out whether you want CTA or not, it was back to the question you actually brought up early, John, which is who uses CTI? 
an incident lead or an incident responder, they're not going to use a news feed. You know, they don't even care about that. They're probably going to be interested in the streaming data that looks like their environments or, you know, sister socks. So you really have to think about your audience, which CTI is all about. Who is your audience and what do they need it? Newsletters get read maybe by some executive somewhere, right? And do you want them to call you? Like, yeah. <laughs> right? Like you put something in there. Oh, this is really bad. Great. They called at seven o'clock tonight. What are you going to tell them that you're doing about it? This is actually- Although they're- there is a case to be made for, hey, there's something going on in the news. You're going to do your investigation. You're going to understand what's happening. And you're going to put out that information to calm the waters or to tell them that something has happened. And so you do have to balance the fact that sometimes you do want to pass information on. So yeah, it's not it's all bad news. You took the words out of my mouth. Actually, that's one of the ways I like to see CTI show up in newsletters like that is, is to be a lightning rod. Hey, we saw this. We read it. We're doing X about it. Yeah, and just a comment on the news cycle, and this is from a lot of years of experience. We used to be ahead of the news cycle. Like if you saw it in the news, we already knew about it for months. The news cycle today and currently is there's no way that socks can understand everything that's going around them. And they may see something in the news that actually does affect them, which is incredible to me. I'm gonna use buzzwords for a second and I'm sorry about it. It will be really interesting to see how this develops over the next couple months as more vendors and more socks use our most favorite buzzword, right? That right now are these large language models uh, to summarize um, some of this information. Yeah. Yeah, we're definitely starting to see uh, some, very, some very, very interesting things come out of that space. Maybe you'll have to do a special episode on that uh, as more and more of that shows up. Uh, one, one of the things I did want to ask about uh, in relation to what just came up there, is the SOC the group that's going to be doing this? Because some uh, organizations will have CTI as like a SOC duty, or at least the people that do it as part of the SOC or they may have it as a totally separate thing or they may totally outsource it. Um, are the analysts doing this kind of work? Do we have dedicated people? Who's gonna be responsible for doing this kind of thing? I think the answer is yes to all of those, just again, depending on your organization. Uh, you know, A very broad brush stroke is larger organizations will tend to have a more independent uh, intelligence team. Smaller organizations often have uh, Intel as an additional duty is assigned. Um, I've been working with a number of smaller socks though, where they are now finding this to be such an integral part of what they do that they are um, even on a small team looking to hire somebody who is experienced in this space or you know, take somebody, transform them into this space. Even if it's just a halftime role, trying to say, you know, there's a multiplying factor to this, that if we can get this intelligence, that means that we are more likely to find the things we're looking for, less likely to be looking for what we're not looking for, um, and that it's worth putting the time in um, versus triaging a whole bunch of stuff that is just garbage. Um, this actually can make that a little bit more, more clear. So I am seeing smaller teams that are starting to bring in dedicated analysts. Um, the other thing to keep about is sometimes threat intelligence is not just um, done within a SOC, you may have intelligence that's done in other parts of your company for other reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen some confusion in terms of what that team might be able to do. Like, should they become your cyber threat intelligence as well as your corporate intelligence um, organization? And that's a really interesting discussion in terms of what level of technical expertise does a threat intelligence analyst need to have versus something else. But I've seen that as well, where you sometimes are going to get um, other parts of your company that are doing this that are even outside of kind of that IT realm. Um, so as usual, it depends. Lots of different ways you can do this, but that's a great point, John, is that not, um, the intelligence doesn't always happen within your core SOC team. Yeah, and I think that feeds perfectly into, into something Kat mentioned she wanted to say as well. Um, uh, before we were recording, you, you had mentioned the, you know, it's not all tech information, right? There's some other kind of aspects of this. Um, can you tag on to what Ingrid was saying there and, and kind of, uh, you know, continue on with, with that thought and explain to the users what you were, or I mean, the listeners, what you were thinking uh, with that statement. Right. So um, bringing together these different kinds of information, just back to that thought of, so Ingrid's mentioning business intelligence. If you have a bus business intelligence unit, I mean, I got excited. I was like, really? People do that now? Because I, I would immediately be over there in their uh, organization saying, what do you guys do? <laughs> and, and, see, and so where the rubber meets the road is about how do you translate what 
uh, a traditional intelligence analyst does into the technology. And that's the hard part. That's why you really need to understand, you need a technologist there who can translate and say, oh, okay, so when this point of sale system hits this malware, this is what that looks like. They're trying to collect this information and put all the pieces together. Um, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, that's, that's what I was thinking, um, uh, you know, along the lines of where is the holistic picture of, of threat intelligence, you know, starting and ending. So yeah, absolutely. Carson, did you have uh, something as well? I do. I, I have feelings on um, my, you know, I usually do share them. Um, I have always been a strong advocate that the cyber threat intelligence function, if one exists, needs to be in the SOC. What well, going along with what Ingrid stated, that might be a separate team and it might not, depending on how big and sophisticated you are. Um, I have found with socks where the cyber threat intel function sits somewhere else in the enterprise it becomes terribly disjoint and self-serving um from operational realities and i strongly advised against it here's a caveat to that however there are other areas of in the enterprise that may be very related to the sock and its intel function and that is an opportunity for collaboration let me give you a very concrete example Let's say you as an enterprise um, have a commerce and payment um, uh, system that interfaces directly with, with, with directly with customers, right? Direct sales. There's going to be fraud in that commerce system. And the way adversaries perpetuate, uh, excuse me, perpetrate and perpetuate that fraud um, is going to have some overlap with ordinary cyber threat intel, right? Where are they coming from? What are they doing? What are their motivations? Once they um, once they have succeeded in their fraudulent payment um, or intentional non-payment, what are they then doing um, through the enterprise's capacity that they've then purchased, right? Or the, or the things they've purchased, what are their motivations? Um, and that's an opportunity for the people doing threat intel and hunting and whatnot in the SOC to collaborate with that other team. So um, just because I advocate for threat and cyber threat intel being inside the SOC doesn't mean there won't be other types of threat intelligence um, apparatuses elsewhere, particularly in larger enterprises. So uh, believe it or not, I totally agree with that. Uh, when I was getting excited about business intel, what I immediately thought is the SOC could really use that information. So I right should have fin finished my thought there. And um, yeah, actually, I think <laughs> I think it's uh, really important that security an analysts that you're in a SOC don't just focus on the technology information. So if there's nothing else that you take away from today's conversation is that the universe is much bigger than technical information within a SOC and that TTPs aren't the only answer and they aren't the only way of informing how you do correlation and look at your business. If you look at banking and what banks do to do fraud detection and that kind of stuff, they, can, they put data together such as where you're physically located with uh, a time of day with your credit card, and then they come up with something and call you, right? This doesn't look like you, is it, right? Um, it's looking at these non-traditional ways of how your business unit runs and augmenting your, your current TTPs and how you do things with other data, other information. That's what I mean about intelligence and information informing your decisions in a SOC. Gotcha. And, and how do you feel about, um, in terms of collecting all of this and, and putting together a big picture like that, uh, attribution? Is that something that uh, for every sock, are we trying to say like, oh, it was that country, right? Or are we just trying to, to back up a little bit from that? What should we expect, you know, as the average organization that's not like a government with access to wide ranging data? We, we spent uh, a lot of time, as with many topics, talking about this. Um, and in, in the book and what we landed on is really the difference between association and attribu or attribution. And really, for a SOC, they, most SOCs, again, outside the government, really don't need to know, hey, it was this particular person behind the keyboard sitting in this city, in this country, whatever else. But what you do need to know is, hey, it was likely this group or this piece of malware or this particular thing, because that gets you into that operational phase of, so therefore we know this is their next step, or these are the tools that they use, or this is how we could go discover them. So it is important to have the context, 
But, you know, uh, we all know that cyber intelligence naming schemes have gotten a little bit um, out of hand. Uh, so whatever particular naming scheme you choose to use, you know, or something else, like leave that to the people who want to do it. Focus on what does that actually mean to you? And again, the actions that you can take based on that or what you should be looking for in the data based on it versus thinking about, oh, I must know it's this particular you know, person in that particular desk. Yeah, and our goal in discussing attribution versus association here is it, there's a real lot of energy in security operations about, I don't need to do attribution, I just need to do this blocking activity. Um, you know, and what we're suggesting is it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be good enough to, uh, you know, augment what you're doing when it comes to response and taking actions in your environment. So that's why we came up with this idea of, hmm, why don't we call it association rather than attribution? I would, uh, one of the, one of the motivations for that, don't just think about it in terms of the context of that specific incident about what level of association or attribution we're going to do. Think about it in the context of seeing that adversary again, thinking about, are they doing the same thing this time versus that time? And what am I doing different this time versus that time? Doing the same thing over and over again might be fine if they're not getting that far along in the kill chain. Maybe it's not, depends on what your motivations are. And I actually want to bring up a point here that we talk about adversaries as you know a thing, an adversary does something, but especially when you're talking about financially based crimes, a lot of times it's a series of different groups. You might have an initial access you know broker, and you know they're working on an affiliate program where they're getting paid for getting that initial access, and then you have somebody else who does the next phase, and somebody else comes in and does ransomware or does whatever they're doing. So it is important to understand how kind of how these groups work together and what their different roles are and where they come from. And so that again, then goes to why you need to understand kind of the strategic landscape of things that are important to you. Um, and why you do need to have that, you know, association of knowing how they interact with each other and so therefore what you can expect. But again, you don't need to know who's actually behind the, the keyboard for a, a That reminds me of something really important. Um, when, we, when we walk into environments, um, particularly those that are not well protected or we think there's a major intrusion in, don't just assume it's just one adversary. It might to be multiple. And don't assume one single adversary owns the entire kill chain. Anyone who's been looking at this data for a long time will tell you it may be one organization that's acquiring um, compromised credentials and they're selling it to someone else. Don't forget yeah. about that. And that's one of the points of having a threat intelligence platform, right? Is like maybe you see the same piece of malware that allowed them in, but then things diverge wildly, right? And then if you see enough kind of commonality across different things, you might be able to say like, oh, this is the entry vector group A uses versus group B, but then they pass it on to group C. And then we see some similarities there uh, without the ability to really organize all of that information. Like you'd never be able to put that kind of stuff together. Um, so yeah, uh, definitely some important um, kind of organizational aspects to even being able to figure that kind of stuff out. Cause otherwise it's, you know, it's already incredibly complex. Uh, yeah. One of the other things discussed in the book I wanted to ask about was uh, it's table 12, the cyber threat analyst artifacts. So if you have a threat intelligence team or if you don't, uh, regardless, I guess, could you speak a little bit about how you might interact with them and the types of threat intelligence reports that would exist? Uh, you know, everything from long form to short form reports and all that kind of stuff. Like, what are, what are we largely dealing with here and, and what are uh, what are we to expect from a threat intelligence team in terms of the format of some of these outputs? Hmm. Well, I think the answer is it depends. <laughs> uh, that's only a half joke. Um, so you, it, cyber threat intelligence always goes back to the audience that you're trying to um, serve. So if you're feeding correlation and incident response, you're likely going to put that in some sort of machine readable format to ingest into something else. If you're trying to write to your executives about here are all the threats that we're seeing to try to get more money for a budget, that's a nice, glossy, pretty report that's or a PowerPoint that's very short, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Uh, Catherine took many of the words out of my mouth that she usually does. <laughs> Um, Sorry. <laughs> no, no. Oh, cool. Um, one of the things to think about in terms of what uh, uh, a threat intel shop puts out is it may not be product that that team is 
responsible for just by themselves. Let me give you a very concrete example. Um, building uh, summary reports after an incident may often have a very strong threat intel component. So it may be the people who do threat intel and the people doing incident response coordination who co-author that. And it may be only a single slide or a single page or something like that, a single picture with some words on it to describe what they what we saw so we know what to do about it next time. So as Catherine stated, it always goes back to um, you know what our intention is and who is our audience, and I'd say you know in the last um, last podcast we talked about kind of the uh, incident management life cycle, and you really want to think about intelligence across that whole life cycle as well. So there are things that you can put out in that preparation and you know prevention phase, which is hey we found out this information we can put you know put a tipper in we can create a detector, we can do other types of things. Hey, there are things that are actually going on with an incident. Well, we should have reports or profiles or things where the incident responders can actually go in and learn about how this adversary that we know is important to us works so that they can make better decisions when they're looking through the data. As Carson was just talking about, it can be part of writing up that reporting, doing part of the, the things. And then it comes into um, your lessons learned at the end, where you actually want to think about, hey, did we even know that adversary was somebody that was on our model? Do we need to update our threat model? Is this somebody we need to get more information about? Is this somebody that we can now protect against differently as we start the cycle over? So threat intelligence happens throughout everything uh, that your SOC is doing through that whole life cycle. There's, there's one other point I'll make here that I just came to my mind is, um, both in terms of the work that the SOC does and the analytic product it provides, uh, we always must be cautious about not creating shelfware. Um, specifically, um, the SOC can spend a lot of time doing intricate forensic analysis of an incident um, purely for the purpose of saying, yup, it was adversary B again. Like we've seen this 30 times in the last 3.2 nanoseconds. Like. A lot of times this can feel both laborious and a waste of time. If it is, don't do it, right? I've seen socks trim a very large percentage of their overall analytic workflow by simply saying, why are we doing this to ourselves? Let's stop. Yeah, I think I've seen that advice uh, given in the form of a presentation. I think it was Chris Cochran that did a presentation on what he called the easy framework. And I think in that presentation, he said something to the effect of, you know, if I'm making threat intelligence, I'm going to hand it to you. And then I'm going to ask, what are you doing with it? <laughs> and if you don't have a very good answer, I might not do that thing anymore. Right. Uh, you know, regardless of whether I'm misquoting or not. Right. That, that's kind of the thing I think you're getting at there is if, if you realize you're creating work and that work has no effect on the environment, doesn't make anything better. Right. That's a good sign that maybe your time is better spent elsewhere. Right. <laughs> exactly. So, um, I think to close it up here, the only question I had left, unless we had anything other other kind of burning statements we wanted to make is, I did want to ask everyone, what are the things that you're looking at every day in terms of just staying high level, you know, situational awareness? Are there podcasts you listen to? Are there news sources you go to, social media, anything really? Um, how are you keeping yourself up to date on a daily basis? I, I can answer this. Um, and I'm not going to name any specific, um, you know, news sites, though I have my favorites and there are a number of aggregators out there, for example, um, is where I'm focused every day are threat intel and, and threat, you know, cyber news generally that will translate into my team needs to go do a thing. We need to go deal with a new, and, and, and usually that takes the form of a new vulnerability that is out or a new campaign that is particularly pertinent to the infrastructure I'm running. And the, the, those, if I'm looking at that right, that translation from news or intel to I need to go spin an incident is going to be non-zero and it's going to be non-zero on a cadence that says I'm looking at the right stuff. Perfect. Anyone else want to chip in on the uh, on the daily keep yourself up to date kind of a cycle? Yeah. So I I mean I use a kind of an aggregator. I bring everything in. I just do quick scans through. You know what what is likely because I I work for an MDR right now. So we're looking across customers across multiple industries. So I'm really focused on what are the big things that are likely to be 
impactful across everything. Um, also, as a manager, I'm looking for things that are different than the day-to-day -day tactical types of things. So I'm looking for the, what are we going to get questions on? What is a customer going to want to know? What are people going to be looking for? Um, and then honestly, internally, like one of our Slack channels is you know, security nerds. And that's where everybody posts like, hey, I saw this, I saw that, I, this is cool, something else. Like, you know, it's, I almost don't have to have my own separate news feed because so much stuff shows up there. Um, but what I look for is, have more than one, per has one, more than one person mentioned this? Like, is yeah. this something that's just kind of getting a little bit of traction? To Catherine's earlier point of, there are plenty of things that show up in the news now that you have not seen or you're not aware of until they start hitting the news cycle. Um, we also, um, you know, have Twitter feeds that we bring in. We have all kinds of other stuff that we bring in. And we're looking for something where there's a little bit of a buzz around it, a little bit of a, hey, this might turn into something where we need to take an action um, because it is popping up. Now you have to be careful because a lot of these aggregators, it's the source comes out and then you have like 15 different um, organizations that report on that source. So you try and get back to, that's one thing I would say is try and figure out how you can get to source reporting versus um, the broader news agencies that are re-reporting something that's already been seen. Awesome. Yep. Yes. And I do all that as well uh, without going into the specifics of the aggregators and all that. <clears throat> um, and also I, uh, look for what actions can I take to do these bigger moves? So like strategically, are there some things that I need to do to preempt something that, or guess to, to anticipate something might happen? One thing I'll say about incident response is you never know which incident's gonna be the big one, so to speak, the one that everybody's concerned about, you know? Um, so, keeping your pulse on what's happening outside is super important because you never know when it's going to like personally affect you suddenly. So that's the only thing I would add to that. And I actually want to say one more thing is we've talked about CTI as a uh, discipline, which it has become about being, you know, small, big, everything else. But the fact is in many socks, even if you don't think you're doing CTI, you're doing CTI because your analysts are reading news reports every day. They're processing information. They're going, Hey, this is cool. This is new. Hey, have we looked at this? Um, and so just be aware of what, you natively have as a capability based on the curiosity of your own analysts and leverage that as well. You know, make sure that you're taking advantage of everything you can with it. Perfect. All right. I think that brings us to the end here. Lots of really rapid fire, good stuff here. I hope we hit what people are looking to, uh, to learn on CTI. I, I know I feel like I did. So, um, awesome conversation here, uh, to wrap it up. You know, I, I think the theme of this whole thing, uh, Carson summed up very well near the end there is like, look for stuff where it's my team needs to go do a thing, right? Not just we're collecting to collect, we're collecting because we want more things on our threat intelligence platform. It's stuff that you can actually make a decision on and drive some kind of useful action that makes security better. So uh, on that final thought, I will say goodbye to everyone. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, we're gonna be back next week with chapter seven, which is select and collect the right data. So we will catch you all then. And thank you again for listening to Blueprint. See you and thank you.